like that. Uh, so, David, welcome to the Whole Man Academy podcast. I don't know what episode this is because um, we've got Scott, our team, who's recording podcasts with guys now, and John Downs, part of our team, recording. So, yep. it'll be episode two or five or ten. Um, we, we're trying to churn through them. Um, but first question for you is, where are you and how are you? Uh, well, I'm home in West London. Uh, I'm currently kind of working from home and I'm sort of self-isolating. So uh, I'm, I'm kind of fine, but I felt better. So uh, not sure I have corona or, you know, just down with general aches and pains and flu. And, you know, I was a bit ill a week or two ago. I had sinusitis and tonsillitis conjunctivitis yeah. <laughs> everything's kind of related to their head um so i'm either run down or i have corona but i'm uh, isolating like a, a professional and uh, doing as i'm told which is very important yeah fair enough and how long have you lived in london for so i've been here about 10 12 years i moved here for work um i never thought i would actually to be honest with you i'm from berkshire Never thought I would come to London because, uh, so I used to work in some very good restaurants out of London and thought, I don't need to go to, to London. Um, but a kind of work opportunity came up. I was traveling in and out of town and I think it kind of made sense. I moved, I moved to Chelsea yeah. um, and managed to save money, which was great, and live in you know, a great area. So it was a yeah. win up all around. So does that mean at the moment, with, with everybody being on lockdown, are you able to get outside a bit and uh, kind of enjoy a bit of fresh air? Yeah, so the last couple of days I've been out for a walk um, and actually just yesterday sat on the balcony to do some work as well. So um, still trying to get some fresh air, but um, definitely not. I'm not doing any exercise, but um, we'll walk, you know, perhaps to the butcher, but just certainly through the park and then back home. Mm -hmm. um, but you know unfortunately I guess I have a, a garden and a balcony here to yeah. enjoy some of the sun priceless at the moment absolutely um, well let's jump into for, for people that want to know more about you you spent 23 years in the food industry um, from, from obviously a young age so tell us about that where did you start and where are you now yeah well um, I mean I started cooking from a very young age and you know, I kind of 12 13 with my nan or my mum and cooking for my dad um obviously I had some kind of part-time jobs um and then I started working full-time just a few days after my last exam so I was actually working Ascot week uh catering in a bar I used to work at in Ascot it was one of my first jobs uh I had a day off to go back and finish my last exam on the Thursday we finished Ascot week uh, on the Saturday, got drunk on the Sunday, and then uh, I started my full-time job on the Monday. Right. Um, and haven't really stopped since. Yeah, nice so, and fresh uh, for your first day. Sorry? Very fresh for your first day. Ab absolutely, yeah, I was kind of <laughs> fresh, and, uh, and yeah, that's really where it started. So I started in a hotel, you know, kind of three or four years cooking there, went to college on day release to do, you know, a couple of courses. Um, yeah. And that's where, uh, that's where it started. Um, to, I was fortunate to kind of, from there, go and work with Heston Blumenthal at the Fat Duck, which, right. you know, it was just a, yeah, it was just a, an incredible experience. And, you know, this is kind of 18, 20, it's a long time ago now, yeah. but um, still leaves a deep impression in my mind. You know, I spent nearly four years or over four years with Heston and the team, um, learned a lot taught me a lot of life skills and uh you know kind of got me into the gym got me focused when you're working with such a high level of, of food or industry such as that you know everything's important so it's all about detail which i kind of transfer into my life now so you know if i'm making a coffee it has to be the best coffee if i'm making toast it has to be the best right and that translates to everything you know i'm uh, yeah, I, 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 I strive for that perfection in most things or everything that I do where, where possible without being a total knob. <laughs> has, has perfection, uh, has the search uh, for perfection? Yeah, that's, that's one of those programs or those books. Yeah. Sorry? Has it held you back at all? Probably only from myself, you know, from uh, being happy or proud or, uh, you know, feeling achievement. Mm -hmm. So um, I think so, you know, I think uh, you can't reach perfection as such. So it's that continual strive or drive to achieve better, achieve more, be better, 
you know, whatever, if it's sport or if it's cooking or if it's family, you know, do more, be better. And I think that's kind of healthy within reason. There's definitely a balance. And, you know, I've kind of learned that again more recently. But um, there's nothing wrong with healthy and it's self-competition. You know, I compete with myself. Yeah. I don't, I don't compete with anyone else. You know, I'm very kind of focused and determined. And I think you shouldn't compete with others. But um, I compete with myself on a daily basis. Fair enough. Well, going back to working at the Fat Duck, I mean, how does a, how does a chef get to work there? And what is the process? Well, a long time ago, it was perhaps very different when he was kind of, Heston was kind of up and coming and he had one Michelin star and a few rosettes, it was very unheard of. Started to get a bit of press. Um, and then my head chef at the time suggested I go and uh, apply. And there was another restaurant, literally 150 meters away called the Waterside Inn, which was owned by Michelle Brew, who recently passed, which is very sad. And again, that had three Michelin stars, one of the best restaurants in the country. Uh, there was only kind of him and Gordon Ramsay, I think, at the time that had three Michelin stars. And I had trial shifts at both restaurants, the Fat Duck first, the Waterside the next day. Heston offered me a job on, on the first day. I went to the Waterside the second. And, I, and they also offered the role or an opportunity. And um, I mean, Heston was just doing some magical things at the time, you know, kind of reinventing what everyone believes, what you think about food, how to cook. Um, it was exciting, you know, it was just exciting and it's hard work. How it's presented. Yeah, how it's presented. I mean, we used to, I, I, we used to start, when I started there, actually, when I was working my notice, I would work there on my days off. So I was basically working seven days a week and we would start at 6am and I started in pastry. So I'd kind of often finish between 11 and 1am was, was normal. Yeah. Um, so kind of 17, 18 hours a day was, was the norm. Um, we slowly dropped those hours back after a year or two that we, we came in later at kind of 6.30, 7am or 7.30. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's hard work. How did you stay, I was going to say stay sane at that point, but also keep your, keep your health? Yeah, uh, well, that, that's a good shout. So Heston, you know, he was responsible for a lot of things in my life, I think. Um, so we used to go to the gym in the afternoon. So you would do lunch service you know, clean down three o'clock, we would try and go to the gym, which we went to in Marlow. Um, so four or five of us would get in a car and have an hour in the gym, come back. And, uh, you know, we would, we would drink a lot of Red Bull and we were drinking a lot of coffee, um, eating a lot of kind of Mars bars and just kind of self motivating. You know, we were trying to achieve great things in the restaurant and it did, you know, over time it built up accolades, you know, two star, three star and the rosettes grew. Yeah you know, it became the world's best restaurant and all of those things naturally evolved. But we, we tried to go to the gym every day. We would meet there. The restaurant was shut on a Monday. We would meet at the gym at 10 o'clock on a Monday, train, have breakfast. So it's kind of that, you know, we were very, very focused. Um, Sounds like a team, a real team. Ab abs absolutely. You've got to rely on each other. Um, Did you have any days off? Kind of, I mean, off from, from the, uh, that environment, even if you weren't actually in there cooking? the monday so on the sunday night we would finish you know you'd finish lunch on a sunday you'd have a bit of a bigger clean down we would finish at five then we would often go for drinks together or go home and, and go out and, and that was your opportunity to go and get drunk yeah so you know we used to go to bars and maidenhead or reading drinking dancing uh monday was the day off which we would often end up working together um or at the gym then go home and then you kind of start the week again on a tuesday um and it was, you know, when I started, I, you know, I crashed my car a few times um, because I was so tired. Yeah. So uh, every morning, you know, in the winter, it was cold. I'd have a jacket and have to have the windows down, playing music loud, trying to drink a coffee. Stay awake. To stay awake. Yeah. And um, I, had one, I had one very big car crash where I wrote off a car. I took out a telephone pole. That was on the way home. Um, but in the morning I would often bang people's bumpers in traffic, mm. you know, you just fall asleep and yeah. when you hit the kite and shit and, um, you wake up and again, windows down and try and get your eyes. Uh, so it was hard work. And, uh, yeah, at one point I said, you know, if I crash again, I have to leave because yeah. three or four crashes, crashes right off the car. It's, it's not healthy. Couldn't Blood afford to die. You, you probably don't know this, um, but I worked in a very esteemed restaurant, uh, which was the Wild of Kent Golf Club down in, uh, down in Maidstone. I've heard of it. I've heard of it. Waiting tables. But even at that, 
you know, I was a young pup then, but I could see that it was, you know, for the guys that were the, so the front line of cooking, it was, you know, you're, you're not getting any real natural daylight. It was hot all the time. Um, yep. They didn't really take lunch breaks because they were continually tasting little bits of food. And often yeah. my friend would say, I'm either not hungry because I'm mildly sick of food because all day you're continually working yeah. with it. Um, yeah, we would try and, we would try and eat, but it, there's very much like that, you know, you yeah. perhaps eat less because you're constantly tasting. So why, uh, what led you to leave the, uh, the fat duck? Uh, I didn't share this earlier. Um, I got fired actually. Right. And, um, the best of us. Well, listen, I mean, this is, this comes full circle. So we were a very small team, uh, and long story, we'd come back from the gym one day. Uh, basically my friend's phone got stolen out of my car. And then I was trying to phone my mum to deal with the insurance because we were, you know, too busy to do anything yourself, basically. Yeah. Uh, had a phone call in this kitchen. This guy wouldn't let me out, who's a, a guy called James Petri or Jockey, who's quite famous, you know, now works for Gordon Ramsay. And, I, you know, I said to this guy, like, you know, gotta let me out, I need to sort this, sort this out. Um, he knew what happened, didn't let me out. So look, if you don't let me out, I'm gonna punch you in the face or I'm gonna smash your face. And, yeah. uh, and I did. And, and at the time, um, at the time, Heston was on the phone to Gary, the head chef, and just, you know, they had a conversation that if that was a guest, you know, that I heard in the background that you can't forgive that experience. Yeah. When you phone a, a Michelin star or a two Michelin star restaurant, <laughs> that can't go on. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, kind of regrettably, I was, I was fired. Um, what was that like? What's interesting, going back to the gym, Heston used to be a kickboxer. Right. And that's where we would, again, so we would do some pads and really got me into that. And um, I was doing some self-defense. And when that happened, uh, previously, winding back, I played ice hockey for a long time. So I was very aggressive. So I loved this kickboxing with Heston. Um, then when that happened, I started kind of fighting. Um, so, you know, one transition, it just allowed me to, um, to have more time to train. Yeah. So mixed martial arts or UFC, which you know was kind of growing in popularity then at the time yeah. and, and still is now. So, you know, it, I was distraught, I guess, at the time because it was probably the best restaurant in the country. Heston was the best chef, the best place to learn. Um, so it was very tough. So you went from there and I know yeah. you also worked with Gordon Ramsay. Yeah, so that was also in between. Um, I was in fact working with Heston and there was obviously a bit of rivalry at the time, with Gordon and, and Heston, mm. which uh, I think now that kind of, um, those relationships don't exist. Everyone's much nicer in the world of food and drink. And not that those people are nasty, but there was a lot, there's a lot more of a competitive streak. Whereas yeah. nowadays, you know, social media and, and friendships, people will share recipes and, and they have a bit of banter on, on social media. Mm. At the time, this didn't exist and i was working at these trade shows uh, bbc good food shows where i was supporting the chefs backstage for presentations and demonstrations for a week every year met gordon who you know i was kind of a fan of from a young age you know inspired you know he kind of also inspired me to continue learning french which is a big passion um i saw him in boiling point you know turn around and bollock a waiter in uh, in french and turn back to english and i thought i, I want to be able to do that yeah and um you know, I'd kind of met Gordon and wanted to go and spend the day there. You often, as a chef, you often go and spend a day in someone else's restaurant for experience. Okay. It's called a stage. So you spend a day or a few days um, for free just to get some experience and see what they're doing. Um, and so I did this one day and a couple of months later, I got the call from his head chef asking me if I wanted a job. And which restaurant um, did you this was restaurant Gordon Ramsay in Hospital Road. So three Michelin star, yeah. so flagship. Um, and I, I just kind of weighed up that Heston was this lovely man, you know, a friend. Um, Gordon at the time, I didn't see as such a nice guy. And I thought I'm never going to get this opportunity again now if I turn it down. Mm. So I, I kind of took it. I left Heston. Everyone said I was doing the wrong thing. Moved to London. Um, and that was another stage of moving. That was pre-proper moving. Uh, and anyway, worked for Gordon. Again, long hours, hard work. What was he like to work for? I mean, he's a lovely, you know, he's a, he's a good guy. He's a good guy. He's, you know, people are after perfection. You've got three Michelin stars. You're charging a lot of money. Sure. Everything has to be 
perfect or as close to it. So I think in the programs you see a hard side of him or certainly in the boiling point shows. Um, so if you, if you fuck up or if you're an idiot, you're going to be told, but if you kind of do as you're asked, yeah. which is still obviously a lot to ask, it's, it's a lot of pressure, hard work. Uh, and ultimately actually I, I didn't get on with someone there and had, I had some issues. Um, I had sold my car when I moved. Somebody was kind of, you know, modifying or breaking my scooter every week. So on a Friday we would finish at 2 AM cause we'd have to mop the floor four or five times. Um, you know, one week my mirror was stolen the next week, the lights were broken, the seat was stolen this. And I thought it was one of the guys I was working with. And after a period of time, I went back into the chef and I said, listen, Mark, I said, um, I said, this is what's happening. This is what's happening. I said, if, uh, if this continues, you know, I'm going to stab him is what I told him. Yeah. You know, 21, 22 at the time. Yeah. Didn't physically mean to stab him, but, um, there would have been drama and, uh, and violence. Yeah. Um, and then ultimately, you know, that happened again another week and I, I'd left, I went back to Heston. So it just shows he was, uh, such a nice guy. They took me back. Yeah. Uh, um, but it was a great, it was a great experience, and uh, partly I think I was too young to go and do that, or not, you know, worldly enough at the time. So you what, know, as an adult, things would be different. I guess the great thing is you've you've worked for two of the the very top chefs, and you know you have to be focused, dedicated, um, and I assume be able to take uh, constructive criticism, even if it's in the form of having your head ripped off by someone. Yeah. Uh, so if um, if you were giving advice to a, a young guy who was looking to move into, you know, wanting to work for not just a restaurant, but some of the top restaurants, um, what advice would you give? I think they just have to be, um, you know, prepared to work hard. So maybe the hours are different nowadays. You know, there's more shift work and they get more days off. So potentially you work four hard days and you have three days off. Right. Okay. Um, so you get that, that break to, to kind a of bit more of a break, uh, you know, just everything that's going on in the world, you know, people have more hours off, there's less pressure. Um, but I think you just have to be committed and prepared. Um, yeah. Ultimately it's all about this commitment and do you really, do you, how bad do you want it? Mm -hmm. You know, do you want to work in a pub and earn X and, and deliver mediocre food or do you want to be the best? Because, you know, they want people in there that are striving for, for similar goals. Yeah. You know, when you're trying to get these accolades and charge that price, everyone has to be aligned ultimately. I guess it comes probably if we, you know, we're speaking to footballers and fighters and guys in the city and media guys, and you realize it does come down to how bad do you want it? Because, yeah. you know, you need to be putting in, you know, not getting to the top of anything is not easy and never has been. So for now, it's, 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 it's putting in the hours. Putting um, the hours and, um, and loving it, you know, you've got to, you've got to love it. You've got to have a passion. You can't, you can't do the 16 hours a day or 18 hours a day if you don't absolutely love it and breathe it and, and desire it, you know? So I was fortunate that at a young age, I had that passion and, uh, I didn't become a chef because I was shit at maths. Um, <laughs> Are you, you any know, good at maths? I'm actually very good at maths. I failed at school. I failed most things at school, but I'm, um, very good at maths. I'm good yeah. with large numbers. Um, and again, that's interesting. You know, if I was to go back to my school now, education is so important, you know, English, maths, communication skills, IT, you know, geography, all of these things help in, in cooking and recipes. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're buying ingredients, paying staff, you have to rotor, you know, it says budgets for staff, budgets for food cost. Yeah. All of those, all of those skills that we do learn at school within reason are important. I guess that the higher up you get as a chef, and as, especially if you intend to run your own restaurant, you, you know, you're, you're not solely a chef, you're a businessman. Yeah, I think so. And I think, you know, the kind of last 10 years, probably of my career, I try to transition more into that, that, you know, I think ultimately I thought I can't do this one at the time. I probably thought at 40, but you know, I'm very close to 40 right now. So I can't do that at 50 standing behind the stove, you know, sure. having hot bits and, um, and cooking all day on your, you know, on your feet for 17 hours a day. So yeah, I tried to transition to that kind of management phase and, um, you know, fortunately that's worked out and there's just a wide scope. So, you know, hospitality is a really good industry and it's diverse. Mm -hmm. I've covered restaurants in airlines, you know, galleries, you know, Royal Albert Hall, 
airline food, cafes, um, and now I'm obviously working on this big project in Dubai, but um, I think there's always a level of food required. There's always yeah. jobs to feed people or produce food, manufacture food. Well, let's, um, let's talk about, you just mentioned it, the, is it the absolute taste that's in Dubai? Absolute Taste is who I work for in the UK. So we're a, a caterer. Yeah. Uh, and they provide catering. They feed McLaren, the F1 team. Um, they do weddings and events. Uh, currently supporting the coronavirus uh, with supermarket food with Morrison's and, yeah. and Deliveroo. But um, they also do big global events. So they did the Saudi Cup last week or two weeks ago, which is a big horse race. Um, and now we're kind of gearing up towards the expo, which is being held in Dubai in October. Um, so I'm kind of working remotely from here because yeah. now there's a travel ban or else yeah. I would be back and forth to Dubai. Would you, would you if, if the world hadn't just gone into meltdown and there was a travel ban, would you be out there now? I'm, I should have been flying Sunday. So right. uh, I'd have been there for three or four days. So the, the plan would be three or four days per month um, to meet suppliers, you know, recruit staff. Yeah. develop the plans and um you know kind of build our infrastructure so now obviously we're having to adapt which again yeah. is what we do in our industry we just adapt and and you make do what you have yeah and that's it you just find a solution and it's tough so let's uh if we move slightly away from food at the moment and ask you I and mean, you've been to our whole man academy events um mm -hmm. and what first brought you to the whole man academy how did you hear about us well, uh, so I've been friends with Matthew uh, for a long time, for five or six years. I met Matthew at my gym, in fact. Um, so we used to have the same PT, became friends. So have you seen Matt working time. out? Yeah, you know. Tell me his level of intensity. Is it on a naught to ten? Is it naught or is it one? It's probably a good one. Good. A powerful good one. one. You know, he's also messaged me about, you know, he wants to do a bit of wrestling. I think he's keen to, you know, probably learn some self-defense skills. Um, you know that's hard work, but we'll yeah. we should set this up and we'll see what happens. We have a team, a whole man uh, wrestling session, and see how Matthew gets on. A whole man WrestleMania. WrestleMania, exactly. I mean, this is a show. I'm seeing I'm it already. That's trademarked. But um, yeah. So so um, the the, uh, the event that you came to, um, which was at the South Place Hotel. What did you think? Yeah, that was right. Uh, fantastic. You know, really good. Um, you know, initially the truth is I was kind of nervous to come at the start and um, and then I really thought, you know what, do you know what, I really need to do this. I also had a friend who kind of killed himself last year who was very young, I think I told Matthew, kind of 30 year old, you know, good looking guy, has everything that I guess we associate with. On paper. Success. On yeah. paper. Uh, and so that was really hard to, uh, that he did that, you know, at such a young age, um, a waste of talent and all of those great skills you need in life. And I just thought, you know, anything I can do or we can do to help mental health, you know, it's obviously become such a big thing nowadays. Yeah. Um, and then after that, I guess, just out of luck, I missed a couple of um, events, which is a shame. So South Place was my first event um, where we had Charlie King, which was great. Yeah. And, um, and Judge on the, on the pod soon. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I just thought they were fantastic and uh, kind of really inspiring. Um, so I guess it was good to to see it to meet like like minded people, mm -hmm. um, listen to their stories and and see what you know you can kind of what resonates with you. So everybody's story is different and their experience, um, yeah. but it was really good. Yeah, so I look I look forward to more. Yeah, that's our thing at the moment. I guess we um, obviously we had our whole man academy dinner as well. Yeah. And, uh, as with most people, we've got all our plans that we had you know for the next three months and just. Shh, 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 um, of course. Well, maybe this is it. You know, maybe we can do uh, digital whole man, and actually, yeah. You know, the the uptake might be more because you can have. You know, I don't know how many viewers you can have, but we could we could you could host a, a digital session. Um, yeah. And then it doesn't matter about people wherever they are. Um, no. That, that's a you know the big thinking behind. Although our events, you know, we really enjoy doing our events. Firstly, they they take a, a lot of energy to organise. You know, to to make sure they're they're right, and, and we've had some events that we would definitely change a lot. Other events like the one you came to where we think we found just the right Mom. kind of, yeah. But, um, but yeah, we realize, you know, the average guy, firstly, 
obviously if the event is in wherever it is, they've got to be able to get to that location. If it's an evening or a daytime event, they've got to have the time, you know, to be able to, to maybe tell their partner or not yeah. be working and et cetera, et cetera. So certainly the podcast enables, you know, guys to listen to it, you know, as many times as they want and in bits hours a day, yeah. wherever they are. So hopefully that's, uh, and you're right, that's what we're exploring is the, the Zoom capability of actually bringing, if you said, look, just X amount of guys, I don't know, 20 guys at a time, but once a week or even you know, um, every couple of days you jumped on a call, it just gives everybody that chance to... That's a really, that's a really nice idea, you know, just kind of throwing it out that you could just see kind of mentorship here, you know, that you could, you could log in for 20 minutes and, and listen to somebody... Um, with an appointment i mean it's uh, a great a great you know there's obviously opportunity from every kind of crisis and i think uh, lots of people are now seeing from corona as we were just talking off there a minute ago about how our lives have changed pre yeah. and post you know well actually that's, we we um we've got a couple of questions from the guys who knew that you were going to be on here today uh one of them is it's quite topical what advice would you give to guys who are crap at cooking but are going to be at home for quite a few weeks Find a girlfriend. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I think I think one good thing is perhaps to try and plan meals. So we haven't started to do that yet because I think the supermarkets are going to level out. Yeah, I mean I might be wrong, but I think um, obviously stocking up on things like rice is really simple. Um, you know, get some some protein in your freezer. Um, but I think I think it's probably a good idea to meal plan. You know, a bit yeah. like meal prep, just so you can think about what you need to buy each week how you can survive. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if they can't cook, I probably can't help them right now, but um, there's certainly a lot of chefs, all of my kind of chefs on, on Instagram are all making videos. Uh, that, I would normally be a big part of that. You know, it's, it's now nonstop. Everyone I know is making videos of how to, and yeah. I used to do a lot of those in my stories, you know, various dishes, um, which people love. But because I haven't been feeling great this week, I've avoided it. But I think in the next weeks, that's something I'll definitely pick up and, and leave as sticky. So, you know, we can ask if people want to make any suggestions. Because um, now's a great time to learn how to cook. Yeah. You know, your three weeks, if you're, if you're stuck in your house, um, it's I, a life skill that everyone I, should be able to do. A, a live Zoom call where you're in your kitchen and you're going to knock up a dish and you've got 20 minutes. And people can log on and, and watch. Look, I'm game. Let's do it next week. We'll, yep. uh, All right. We'll cook anything. And, and exactly, we can set a time limit, you know, 10 minutes, 10 minutes of prep, 10 yep. minutes of cooking within 20 minutes, show them how to feed their family. Um, yep. Great idea. So there's kind of no excuse right now for people not to be cooking. I totally uh, agree. I know everyone's, a lot of people are buying food in, but with the power of kind of YouTube and the internet, everyone can learn how to do yeah. things um well that's that's um uh, maybe you see my personal instagram stories but i've been really frustrated in the last few days when people have you know especially some of the people that i know who've got gardens so we're not to have yeah. someone lives in an apartment but i've still felt the need to to go out and you know and you're like listen it's fine if you're doing essentials but they're saying i need to go out for exercise but it's the same with cooking i hadn't thought about you know most people have no everybody unless you've got haven't got a computer, have got access to, as I said in my Instagram, 500 million online workout videos. Absolutely. But actually, there's probably not far off that of, of free cookery, you know, as you say, Instagram lives or just, you know. There are so many, there YouTube. are so many, you know, even if you go onto BBC website or, you know, Google anything, if you want to learn how to make, somebody asked me today about chicken wings, you yeah. know, Google it, there must be a hundred videos, a hundred yeah. recipes and 10 people, you know, that have this on their stories. So, no excuse You're no right. excuse guys <laughs> no excuse actually i have got an excuse i'm lucky that my my partner is really good at cooking um and i'm really busy doing other stuff so she oh, no of course of course you've got this to do you've yeah, got exactly. um no this is work yeah. um yeah of course well actually what we agreed was that uh and i think this is this is fair emma cook i mean emma's a nutritionist as well and, and a proper okay. nutritionist who's actually qualified not one that has done a, a weekend's bloody course yeah. online and then says yeah. i'm a nutritionist no no you're not you don't know what you're talking about and it's dangerous anyway that's another podcast but we agreed for emma and i emma cooks basically breakfast lunch and dinner every day but i said i would do uh friday night's dinner um, okay yeah 
I haven't actually done one yet, and that's been. Oh, I did one in about four months, I think. So that was, you know, in 2017. Yeah, I'm I'm building up. Well, let me know if you want any tips. You know, I've yeah. Uh, Probably if I tell her that I've spoken to you, she'd expect me to actually. She'll expect. Things. Yeah, she'll have high expectations. A dangerous game to play. Um, yeah. Well, whilst we talk about uh, cooking, one of the other questions was, what's your favourite dish to cook? I mean, it's a really tough one. And again, I think it's a bit of, uh, I'm going to swear here and say a bit of a wanky question. You know, what's, yeah. um, what it depends on when. Sorry? It depends on where yeah. you are. And you know, what. yeah. So we love, uh, I guess we love a lot of diverse food. So once a week we'll have a ramen, so a, a kind of a soup, you know, kind of soup meal, noodles, meat. Yeah. So often on a Sunday we'll have roast chicken, then we'll make the stock. All very romantic. Again, as we talked about earlier, that utilization. So, try not to have anything to waste. So we'll yeah. try and make a really good stock and then a day or two days later, we'll have a, a kind of chicken noodle soup. Um, so I really love that. Um, I really love kind of simple cooking at home. My girlfriend is a very good cook. So I d again, it's not always down to me to, um, to provide meal times. Yeah. Um, I worked in a, a kosher food business for five years or five and a half years. Right. So you know, that ultimately and short of it means no bacon. We were dairy free, so no butter, no cream, um, no pork products. So um, bacon is a big fan of, uh, of me and I'm a big fan of bacon. So um, the weekends are really important to have bacon and pork. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I certainly love, you know, I also love steak is a big thing. Yeah. I, I really am into meat and, um, but you know, just being responsible here, we, we buy our meat from the local butcher. Sure. So uh, trying to buy the best we can and we're happy to eat less of it. You know, we're eating uh, vegetarian one or two days a week. Yeah. So, so talking about, around, steak, you know, saving the planet. If, if steak is, you know, something that you're really passionate about, if you're going to eat out and we're talking about in London here, um, what are the kind of one or two restaurants that if you said, you know what, this weekend I'm going out for a really good steak, where for you would you go? I think places like Hawksmoor, are, you know, so someone that's specific to that niche and M restaurants, you know, they, that is what they do. Yeah. You know, if you want the best steak, you go to a steakhouse. Yeah. What about uh, Goodman's? They're, kind of, they're independent. Sorry. Have you been to Goodman's? Goodman's, exactly. Steak specialist. Uh, that is their passion and they build their business upon that. So I think, I think it's really important to think about, you know, what do you want to go and eat? Yeah. And if you want to eat a steak, seek them out, you know, um, if someone does everything, they, they can't be great at everything yeah. continually. So, um, you know, Hawksmoor and, and, uh, and Goodman's are great. And um, it's a shame, obviously, right now, all these restaurants are closed. Um, so the hospitality industry is really affected. It's, um, you know, kind of a third of our country mix is made up by hospitality. Yeah. You know, hotels, restaurants, cafes, pubs. Millions of people are unemployed. Um, so it's tough. I think it's really yeah. good that, you know, when this comes back, we need to support our country. I think for most of us, we'll be, um, I mean, for, for, for myself, you know, working in London for working, living in London pretty much for kind of 20 years meant that you'd, you'd been to a lot of these really nice restaurants. And um, now that we moved away to the countryside, you really miss, you know, there's a few things I miss. One is really good sushi. Yeah. The other is really good steak. And, and actually I, I, I now won't eat steak in let's call it normal restaurants because yeah. after you've been to somewhere that we, you know, the, the restaurants we discussed, it's so good there. Yeah. I'd rather only yeah. ever eat steak there and, and, and be that, you know, very rare occurrence than actually just eat, eat it out somewhere else. Yeah. I think that's good. Maybe we should teach you how to make, you know, to cook steak at home. So if you can yeah. find your local butcher, because there's some kind of good techniques you come around. A lot of it is really around the technique and, um, yeah. I think that's probably what I learned more so working with Heston was techniques around cooking. You know, that's a great one. You, you don't do things just for the sake of it or because you've been told or because that's what your mum did because yeah. they're terrible cooks. Um, so you really have to think about what you're doing and that's kind of my thought process. The same is ingrained in me from Heston. You know, why are we doing that? Question yeah. everything. Why am I frying the steak? How am I going to get the best texture? Yeah. What texture do I want to achieve? You know, how do I achieve it to be pink throughout? So maybe we could do a, a steak session with Whole Man Academy. Um, I'm sure that'd be very popular with the chaps. And, and again, just buy the best steak you can afford. Now, you know. in, in fact, talking about um, the, the mix of, 
as a chef, you know, you, maybe you need to understand, you know, it's not just about cooking. There's, there's all the different parts to it. But how does it work as a chef? Are you ever concerned about the, the health, the nutritional value of what you're cooking? I mean, I know especially that the, sometimes a lot of the um, restaurants, like I've been to the Marcus Waring at the Berkeley and the different mm-hmm. restaurants where a lot of stuff is obviously cooked in butter. Um, and, and just generally, I just wonder what your thoughts were. Do you, if you're designing menu, do you think about the nutritional side of it or is it, is it more taste? How does it work? Yeah, I think it depends on the experience in the restaurant. So you talked about Marcus at the Barclay. I mean, that is a, it's a fine dining restaurant. Um, you know, it was two mission stars, now one mission star. It's their kind of experience is where you go and have a great dinner and you pay and you know, you're enjoying it. You're not thinking about did I get my five a day? So fine dining, you know, isn't about providing people with fine five a day. It's, it's about giving people a great experience, food that tastes amazing. They can't recreate themselves. Um, you know, it's delicious. It looks pretty. It's served, you know, with great hospitality. Um, so most restaurants aren't really about nutrition. Yep. I think more so now it's become over the last few years with allergens, it's become really important. Yes. Um, but I think that's probably more high street restaurants. You know, they'll start looking at calorie counts. They want to be responsible. Allergens are obviously huge and, and playing a big effect now in, in, in the world, you know, everywhere. In fact, you know, kind of dairy intolerances, nut allergies, yeah. you know, wheat intolerances. Um, but I think as a whole, no. Um, I think it really depends on what kind of business you're in and, and right. who the market is. So the project I'm currently working on Dubai, again, it's a, it's a visitor attraction. So again, I think we're trying to provide really authentic food that's good value for money, tastes delicious, looks fantastic. Yeah. You know, I'm considering Instagram and that's kind of where I'm at now. But the food has to be great. It has to be affordable, has to make us a margin, mm. but it has to be Instagrammable. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, how many calories are in it? It's not really in our um, in our remit. Yeah. There's there's certain elements. You know, we've got a family area where we're doing ice cream and considering freak shakes, which are, you know, kind of a giant milkshake with two three thousand calories. That, yes. Um, yeah. We you know we think that's obviously a very big treat and uh, and it's a special occasion, but um, that's not the sort of thing we'd encourage to eat all the time. No. But um, as a whole, I think um, nutrition isn't really considered in that. But um, yeah, fair enough. Now, at home, we eat very healthily. Yeah. Well, we do enjoy on from a bit that, of butter. I asked you um, with a couple of questions earlier, you know, what one of your biggest challenges, and you said about um, breaking the ground with the chef ready meal range. So tell us, tell oh, us yeah. more about that, if you don't mind. So, uh, some time ago, I worked at Marks and Spencer's five, six years ago, uh, doing food innovation for the supermarket, which was right. an incredible experience. Um, and at the time, and also kind of around the time I was leaving, I had this idea for a meal range, including four or five or six celebrity, but kind of high profile chefs. Uh, and that doesn't exist. Um, at the time, it wasn't something m and would do because they don't endorse celebrities or people like that. Yep. You know, Heston is with Waitrose and probably at the time Sainsbury's was um, working with Jamie Oliver. Right, yep. Um, but more recently I've kind of landed in a role now where I'm working four days a week so I can try and do projects like this. Excuse me. Um, so right now I've, I've managed to find a team or a, a group of chefs. So I have four or five chefs that are keen on the project. I've got a manufacturer, um, who I'm actually hoping to have a call with today. So this is very interesting. Yeah. And we're hoping to sell a mill range into Sainsbury's. Uh, with some kind of exclusivity because they have big coverage and yeah. then from there take it into Ocado and Tesco's and anyone else that wants it but um, I think it can be huge you know I've spent a long time considering this and I just think it'll have broad appeal if there's five or six different personalities each creating a meal or two uh, and in time I think the range will grow to you know soup salads and snacks yeah um, and I think obviously with the popularity of programs on the telly, like Great British Menu, MasterChef, um, and Instagram, everyone wants to be a chef. Everyone yeah. loves these guys. You know, they all know Tom Brown. They all know, you know, Gordon Ramsay and Tom Carriage. Mm-hmm. So if you could go to the supermarket and pick up one of the meals off their shelves, or you pick up one of Sainsbury's, you know, hopefully you're going to be swayed towards, um, towards nah. my meal range. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, so, 
Here's the next question for you. Fighting. Again, saying how did you get into it, but what did you enjoy about it and do you still do it? Yeah, so uh, well, I, I started playing ice hockey when I was around seven, probably until about 17 when I started working or thereabouts, you know, 16. Um, and that was quite an aggressive sport. So I've always been fairly you know, aggressive, boisterous, didn't play football at school, um, so always played hockey. Yeah. And there was, you know, occasional fights. Um, and then again, probably after that age, I was teaching hockey. When I started working with Heston, I couldn't teach kids hockey anymore. And all I had time to do was a bit of this self-defense class, which I enjoyed. Um, then we'd go to the gym. Heston got me into this kind of boxing and kickboxing, which I loved. I got fired for punching uh, jockey. Yeah. Uh, and then I was, I was attending these fight shows that were in my hometown in Bracknell called uh, Extreme Brawl. And at the time there was a flyer and it said, uh, if you want to train with the best and you know, blah, 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 call this number. And I did. Um, and that was in probably 2003. Um, and then 2004, I had my first fight, which was um, highly exciting. How did that go? I won in 56 seconds. Uh, it was fairly aggressive. But, um, and is this, lot... this, what, what were the rules there? Is it un, under the MMA or kickboxing? Yeah, so it's, it's mixed martial arts, which is a, the kind of global sport. Obviously, people yeah. refer to it as UFC, which is more a brand. So UFC yeah. is a a brand um, that, you know, use or they, you know, they fight under mixed martial arts kind of rules and um, they're the biggest organization in the world. Um, so rules, you know, you're not allowed to grab shorts, you're not allowed to headbutt, no eye gouging. This sounds dramatic now that I'm reading it out to you. Sounds like um, a in Maidstone when I was younger. No, no knee in the head of a downed opponent. So ultimately, you are allowed to kickbox, you know, elbow, knee to the head, anybody standing. Um, you can wrestle, throw, submit, you know, choke them out. You yeah. can't stick your fingers in the eye. You can't hit them in the balls. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, there's a lot of rules to it nowadays, and the sports have really, really evolved. Um, but for four or five years, you know, I had about nine fights um, and loved it. You know, I, I trained, I had some training in America. I spent my 30th birthday in Thailand kickboxing. Wow. Um, and so I think this, that competitive edge has always been in my DNA. Mm -hmm. But I guess there's um, a lot of, a lot of us are competitive, but uh, when you get punched in the face, um, your level of um, competitiveness maybe dwanes, uh, you know, for a lot of people. So yeah. what was it like for yourself, especially the first, first time you actually got in the ring and, and fought, and then you carried on for eight more fights? Yeah, my first experience, 100%, was a bit of an out-of-body experience. And I'll never forget that night, you know, and, uh, and the kind of party afterward and the smells and all of those memories or associations that I have with that night. Um, it was great, you know, it gave me, gave me boost bumps now thinking about it. Um, I love it. Like I say, I am aggressive and competitive. Yeah. And um, I think you've got to be able to kind of take a punch and just think, you know, I'm fine. You know, as long as you can see what you're doing, mm -hmm. uh, you've, got, you've obviously got to have some skill sets. You've got to be okay at it. You know, you've got to be able to box and kickbox and wrestle. Um, I think a lot of it, as I've become older, is all about the mental side. You know, it's, you've won the fight before you've got in there. So it's, it's all down to you and, and kind of your mental health. Yeah. You know, and then positivity and, you know, so I would do a lot of um, kind of visualization before the fights. Um, obviously, you've got to be in great shape, training hard, eating well. You've got to weigh in the day before. So there's a, um, there's a lot actually get into that, you know, kind sure. of sacrificing going out, sacrificing drinking alcohol. What, what weight were you fighting under? At the time, it was under 70 kilos. So it's uh, 155 pounds. Um, I'm much heavier now. Did, uh, so did you find that easy? I mean, we, we had at one of our uh, previous events, Greg Wooten, who was the uh, Muay Thai world fighting champion. Yeah. Um, I, I'm rubbish at knowing these different weights, but he's, you know, he's um, probably the same kind of build as me. And he said it was, for him, it was very hard, you know, totally draining, making weight, yeah. you know, trying to cut yeah. before the fight and maintain your power and your, you know, your energy and everything else that goes with it. Yeah. How do you find that? Um, so at the time, you know, I was doing mixed martial arts a long time ago before it was cool. 
you know, nowadays everyone loves UFC, everyone wants to do it. Um, so at the time we knew less about it. Um, so I didn't actually cut that much weight. You know, I'd probably diet down two or three kilos and, you know, maybe lose a kilo overnight. Sure. Whereas nowadays people can do 10 kilos, 12 kilos, no problem. So, you know, most of that would be through diet a few weeks in advance. Then there's kind of a water shed yeah. uh, um, where they kind of basically the week before they load up on water and then they kind of dehydrate. So, um, you know, you kind of stop water you have hot salt baths just to mm. dehydrate saunas. Um, and there's a, there's a way, there's a technique to that, which, you know, the last five, six years people have mastered and they can do it very, very well. But, um, you know, it depletes liquid from your brain, which obviously isn't the most healthiest. Yeah. So you need to be doing that with professionals. Yeah. Not, and not. I think, you know, 10 years ago when I was fighting, we weren't quite at that level of, um, the weight cut wasn't there you know we weren't training in so many areas that we are now you know nowadays it's such a dynamic sport and everybody has you know coaches for this coaches for that and um you know when i started you were either a kickboxer or a wrestler and you know if you couldn't punch them in the face you would wrestle them and take them down and nowadays you know you have to be good at you know gymnastics and you have to be explosive you have to be strong yeah you'll be able to wrestle yeah. so it's just um it's a tough sport. It's so tough do, you sport. Still, do you still practice as opposed to actually, you know, competing now? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, for a long time. So I kind of fought for, you know, four or five years. Um, and then I was refereeing. So refereed some, some great shows again for four or five years. Um, I actually run a, a mixed martial arts consultancy as well. So I had a website at the time. Right. I was selling fight belts, you know, I'd provide ring girls um cage hire insurance okay. so i was providing a kind of consultancy service which is kind of new to the industry at the time uh but now i'm i'm pretty much removed you know i watch it on tv i've got a lot of friends that still fight um yeah. and i train in, in brazilian jiu-jitsu which is kind of one aspect of mixed martial arts uh i do wrestling so i have a wrestling coach um and then we're friends you know we box kickbox wrestle yeah, spa, but very much on a low key friendly level. Mm -hmm. um, but it's kind of good to keep fit and um, yeah. keeps the fitness ticking over. And and it's a buzz, you know, it's an absolute buzz. So I, yeah. I really love it. I'm impressed. I, I think it takes a, a a a special type of person to to not just decide to train and get in the ring once, but actually to do it several times. Um, my fighting career, I know you're desperate to know. Um, I, I did kickboxing for a very short time uh, and, and not to the point we were just training and one guy did some controversial roundhouse kick and his, his boot tickled the hairs on the end of my nose and missed it by a, you know, a, a whisker and that was the moment I thought if he'd have made contact you know, I'd, I'd be able to smell around corners yeah. so I, I said I'll, I'll go back to football yeah. Yeah. thanks very much um, but yeah it's I know Mike Tyson was it that said everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face. Okay. And it's true because in mixed martial arts, you know, lots of people come from this kind of grappling or jiu-jitsu base and, and you kind of grab hold of people, tie them up, get them to the ground, you know, look for a submission or a choke. Um, but again, if you're doing that and someone punching you in the face, you've got to be able to keep your composure, Yeah. you know, get out of that, to turn it around. Um, and I, I'm kind of fortunate that, I'm okay with that. Yeah. You know, I'm okay with being punched. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's always good. And also for, you know, generally in life, you never know what's going to occur, but if you're, you know, for the average person, if you go out and something occurs and you get whacked in the face or something, most of us would probably you know, freak out, freeze, want to yeah. run away. But if, if, if you've conditioned yourself to be able to actually, react in the right way and maybe that's staying calm as opposed yeah. to you know beating the crap out of them um i know i used to work with a um a lovely girl who i think she was a second dan um you know in karate and her partner was a fourth dan now i haven't got a clue what that means but i knew it meant that they were they good. were very good. i think he'd competed in the you know commonwealth games yeah but naively i remember thinking oh that's great because you know like he, he can beat anyone up and and she said she said, honestly, it, you know, you got to remember that you're fighting in controlled conditions. Whereas you could be in a pub with some guy who's smaller than you. And yes, you could take him apart, but you don't know if his mates behind you with a bottle and smashes you over the head. 
Again, yeah, absolutely. I've, yeah. I've been out many times in, uh, in Maidstone. Um, and I remember thinking, this is a good point because controlled conditions, you know, it's just you and him. You don't have to contend with all the other factors around you. Um, and have you had that where you've been out and you've had to kind of use your, your uh, skills? Not, not for a long time. You know, when I was young and kind of spunky, you know, I used to go out drinking and possibly end up in more of those situations or some of my friends would get in trouble. So I'm very defensive of my friends. So I would step in and, uh, you know, but I think since I started fighting, I've never had a fight on yeah. the street. Um, but, you know, you're pre I'm pre prepared. Yeah. It sounds really naff, but, you know, you just, I'm aware of my surroundings all the time. It's, it's what you do. You know, I also used to do the, used to work on the door for a few years. Right. Um, but you're just aware, I'm aware of my, I'm alert all the time. I yeah. like to be in control. So I just think of my surroundings when I go into places and um, that, mean, that way means that means a few people. You're a good friend to have around. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, we all, we all need that um, friend or two who can, I don't know, back you up. Um, I, I don't think my, my best friend Tom wasn't at the event when you came, but he was at, he was at the previous one. But many years ago, I mean, Tom's maybe 6'2", six, 6'3". Six, He's, you know, probably at the time was maybe 15, 16 stone. Yeah. Uh, that's his dream weight now, but that's another story. And um, I remember it was, it was a night out in Maidstone and, and some guy walked past us. You know when someone just eyeballs you for no yeah. reason and you kind of follow his eyes because you think, is he looking at me? And there was a group of us and he started giving us a bit of shit. And uh, one of my friends stepped in and said, you know, what, what's, the, what's the problem? And this guy started doing this and he pulled a metal bar out oh, and you think okay this this isn't good so uh we thought look that you know if there's two or three of us you know we can you know and there's only this one guy we can take take him on and then i turned around and and, and my friend tom was never blessed with a, a a hot pace for running but he was a good 100 meters down the high street running in the other direction uh, and i remember thinking thanks for thanks for letting us you know uh handle this one on our own so that means from now on, if I'm out in London, I know if I'm with you. Call me up. Yeah. We're, we're safe. We're safe. And I know Matt's, uh, Matt's like 6'4", so he, he, um, he can take care of himself. As you said, he's super fit. Or, some, yeah. or something like yeah. that. But I would, you know, just to add, I would look for the resolve nowadays. You know, there's, there's no need for that. But certainly, yeah. it's good to have. If it does kick off in a pub or anything, it's, um, it's a good skill to have. Even if it's just yeah. restraining people, you know. I, um, it's something. It's something. It's a good. It's a good. It's definitely a good life skill. I was talking about other skills again. That discipline, focus. We're talking we come back to the career. Yeah. Talking of, of of good bits of advice. I know I asked you earlier. Um, one bit of advice, if you could give to a man, so he could do his life better, and you said persevere. Um, I think so. Add any more things to that? You know, I think if we have kind of goals or aspirations or a career path or, you know, a, a goal that we want to achieve. You know, we all know people achieve things from working hard. You know, athletes don't get into the Olympics from, you know, training once a week casually. They commit to it. They commit to it and make a plan. So perhaps it's make a plan and persevere. Um, and that can be said for everything. You know, at school, if you want to get better at maths, you have to, you know, try harder, you know, put the effort in carry out these steps, you know, perhaps get a tutor, improve week on week. So I think it's that perseverance is a big thing um, for whatever it is, that's relationships, making money, learning to cook, learning to learn a language, riding a bike. You know, if you, if you fall off, you know, get back on, let's do it again. And, and kind of the more of those hours that we discussed. Um, so I think perseverance is a really big thing. And you've just got to have that mental strength to focus, you know, focus and persevere. Yeah, I think it's it's important for guys, as you say, if you if you look at any of the, um, you know, guys are at the top of their game in, as you say, whether it is sport or cooking or finance or media, these people are pretty much living and breathing their their career. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just, Don't just less less it. less distractions. You know, when I was when I started cooking, it wasn't great. I didn't have a life. You know, I wasn't going out shagging girls and having girlfriends and that's maybe now put me in the position where I am, but, um, that's where you know, I in the, 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 same, the same in sports, you know, if you want to be good at something, you have to put in the hours, you have to watch your diet, you have to commit to it. So you really have to love it. You have to have the passion, but that commitment to, uh, and self belief, you know, don't worry what other people are doing. Just focus on yourself. Yeah. Being, um, determined. I think we determined and, and focused. I yeah. see a, chap, a chap who's going to be on a podcast, but, 
we were asking him and he said, you know, as you say, you're going to get knocks along the way. And, you know, if you see um, what you, if you call them problems, but they're going to be opportunities to learn. Cheers, um, absolutely. Is part of it. Well, I tell you what, let's, let's wrap it up. So I know you're busy. You've got, uh, you've got things to do and, and people to see. I was going to say places about to go. my fake tutorial. No, no one's got places to go anymore. Um, but yeah, perhaps we'll um, if we can jump on um, a call maybe next week. We'll organise a date where we could do a uh, a great British steak off. Um, Sounds fantastic. Something like that. Uh, so in the meantime, I would like to say thank you very much for talking to us, and uh, and we will speak to you later. Thank you for having me. All right. Thanks.